मुकुंद मोरारी राम कृष्ण हय बोलो हरे हरे मुकुंद मोरारी राम कृष्ण हय नरसिंह वामना श्री मधुसूधन राजेन्द्र नंदन नरसिंह वामना श्री मधुसूधन राजेन्द्र नंदन श्याम भूतन घातन खैता बसातन जाय दशरथी राम भूतन घातन खैता बसातन जय दशरथी राम यशोद डूला गोविंद गोपाल वृंदवना पुरंद यशोद डूला गोविंद गोपाल वृंदवना पुरंद गोपी प्रिया जन्न राधिका रामन गोवान सुंदर भोरा गोपी प्रिया जन्न राधिका रामन वन सुंदर भोरा रावण था खोरा मखन दर गोपी जना वस्त्र रावण था खोरा मखन दर गोपी जना वस्त्र मनोहरा मोहन बम शिविहारी मनोहरा मोहन बम
Prachajana Paya Hari Yamuna Jeevan Atili Parayana 
मानस चंद्र चोरा नम शुरास को कृष्णया को वचन मन नम शुरास को कृष्णया रखो भजन मन मोरा बाबाजी से लोक प्रवेश निद्रचरियुत जीवा बोलो हरे हरे मुकुंद मोरारी राम कृष्ण हरे कृपा हाय गोर हरि भो हरि भो हरि भो मिथाय गोर हरि भो गोर प्रेम नंदे हरि भो नम ओम विष्णुपताय कृष्ण पिस्ताय बुद्धवे श्रीमती भक्ति विनाथ स्वामी नमस्ते सरस्वती ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया नारायणम नमस्कृत नरम चरोम दैवीं सरस्वती व्यास तथोजयुतिरयत नायु वभद्रेशु निगवत सगवती उत्तम श्लोक भक्तिर्भवती नैस्तक We're reading Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto Six, Chapter One, entitled "The History of the Life of Ajamila," Text Number Six. Aduneha Mahabhaga, Yathaiva Narakan Nara, Nanogra Vatanan Neyat. तन्मे तुम अधुने महाभागा नरक नरा नोग्रयतनन्मे व्यख्यायुम आहसि अदुनेहा महाभगा यथा नरक नरा 
Nanograyatananeyat Tanme Vyakyatum Arhasi You have to read for me. Huh? You have to read it for me. Vini Adhunena, right now, Iha, in this material world, Mahabhaga, oh greatly opulent and fortunate Shukde Goswami, Yatha, so that, Iva, indeed, Narakan, all the hellish conditions into which the empires are put. Nara, human beings. Nana, varieties of. Ugra, terrible. Yatanan, conditions of suffering. Na, yet, may not undergo. Tat, that, me, to me. Vyakhya, tum, arhasi. Please describe. Translation and purpled by Shri. Prabhupada ke dwara. O greatly fortunate and opulent Shukde Goswami, now kindly tell me how human beings may be saved from having to enter hellish conditions in which they suffer terrible pains. Purport In the 26th chapter of the 5th canto, Shukde Goswami has explained that people who commit Sinful acts are forced to enter hellish planets and suffer. Now Maharaj Prikshit, being a devotee, is concerned with how this can be stopped. A Vaishnava is para dukha dukhi. In other words, he has no personal troubles, but he is very unhappy to see others in trouble. Palad Maharaj said, My Lord, I have no personal problems, for I have learned how to glorify your transcendental qualities and thus enter a trance of scarcity. I do have a problem, however, for I am simply thinking of these rascals and fools who are busy with Maya Sukha, temporary happiness, with knowledge of devotional service unto you. This is a problem faced by a Vaishnava because a Vaishnava fully takes shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He personally has no problem. But because he is compassionate toward the fallen conditioned souls, he is always thinking of plans to save them from their hellish life in this body and the next. Prakshit Maharaj therefore anxiously wanted to know from Shukdev Goswami how humanity can be saved from gliding down to hell. Shukdev Goswami had already explained how people enter hellish life and he could also explain how they could be saved from it. Intelligent man must take advantage of these instructions. Unfortunately, however, the entire world is lacking Krishna consciousness and therefore people are suffering from the grossest ignorance and do not even believe in a life after this one. To convince them of their next life is very difficult because they have become almost mad in their pursuit of material enjoyment. Nevertheless, our duty, the duty of, the, of all sane men is to save them. Maharaja Bhikshas is the representative of one who can save them. Shri Gurave Namaha 
Vanchakaupatarubhyascha-kripa-sindhu-bhai-hevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Maharaj Parikshit is showing the compassionate nature of the pure-hearted Vaishnava, his concern for the fallen conditioned soul, suffering and hell. And of course at the end of the fifth canto, Sukadev Goswami had described in quite a bit of detail the different kinds of hell which are there, which people have, which the sinful people have to enter into, have to go through. So, hearing all of the different kinds of hell which are there and how much suffering is there, Maharaj Parikshit felt very much concerned for the deliverance of the, the fallen souls. And as Srila Prabhupada says, it, it's a very difficult task to save the fallen souls. He said, people in general, they don't believe in the life after death. Prabhupada went to Moscow and met Prope Professor Katovsky and he was the professor of Asian studies and Prabhupada was speaking about reincarnation and the professor simply said, Oh Swamiji, at the time of death everything is finished. So Prabhupada was shocked to think that this man who was supposed to be a professor of Asian studies could not understand the existence of the soul. And of course this is very common today. Even common pe ordinary people, they don't, they don't think about it. They don't even want to think about it. They don't, want, they don't care about what's there after death. They're they're just thinking, let me enjoy now. And for them, their enjoyment is, of course, it, it's actually suffering. What they think is enjoyment is actually the most miserable type of, of uh, hell. When, when people uh, go to eat, they eat the most disgusting kinds of foodstuffs. The, we're hearing different devotees. Uh, just yesterday, one lady came up to me at the Rathiatra and she was saying, you know, I, I really want to get initiation, but is it all right if we cook meat for our family members? And so I told her, no. I said, no, you can't, you can't do that. And she said, Oh, but my family, they, they, they insist I have to cook for them. And she said, my daughter, she lives in Australia. And I go there twice a year. And when I go there, they always want me to cook. I said, well, you should tell them. You know, tell them, you know, that you're not going to cook meat for them. But she said, oh, no, they insist. I said, but, well, why do you go there then? <laughs> You know, she said, well, she's my daughter, you know. So, so I said, well, if your daughter means more to you than the meat you eat, then you're not fit for initiation. <laughs> really, if, if you're thinking more about your daughter than you think about the cows and all the other animals that, which you cook, then you're not really, re you're not in the proper mood for initiation. But this is, you know, even among people who come to Rathiatra and take part in Rathiatra, <laughs> they have difficulties to follow things like you know, not cooking meat. Hmm? But we see all over our, our devotee communities are quite uh, faithful to this principle. I got a letter from Russia and one lady was telling me how 
she was trying to get initiation and she was the, the devotees were telling her you cannot get initiated because you still cook meat for your husband and you know, so that's russia you know in russia people of course you know the they're, they're pretty big meat eaters, but they're, they're also vegetarian, you know. People are, some places, some people, there's a, a minority, maybe a minority, but there are people vegetarian, strict vegetarian. So it takes time to bring about this change, to educate people about these things. Just like... Uh, we can see how the world's changed, you know, over the years. Uh, one devotee was telling me about an, uh, one man who came, uh, there, there was this conflict in, among the Christians in Switzerland, in Geneva actually. We were talking about preaching because uh, one of the devotees had gone to Geneva and she's trying to do some preaching there. And so this one devotee, devotee called Guru Garanga Prabhu, Prabhupada disciple, he, he was the president there in Prabhupada's time. So he spent a lot of time there and he also even got Swiss citizen, Swiss, he became a citizen of Switzerland. So uh, he told me how hundreds, a hundred or two hundred years ago there was a conflict between the Christians there and this one Christian guy who had a different opinion from the head of the, the, the church, he got condemned to death and they burned him at the stake. You know, <laughs> something like Joan of Arc, you know. <laughs> the famous burning at the stake is in Paris. They burned Joan of Arc at the stake. Joan of Arc, she led the, the French army or something and and when she got defeated, they burned her at the stake. And so this, this man who had a, a different idea about the Trinity in the Christian church, he got burned at the stake. <laughs> so even countries which we think are quite neutral, like Switzerland, you know, they have some very strong ideas of, about what you can do and what you can't do. And they don't welcome people to come and uh, propagate religion there. He told me actually according to the law, it's against the law in Geneva to wear the robes of a monk. Because in the past they had problems with Jesuit monks. So they think monks, wearing monks robes are all Jesuits. And, you know, and they're, so they have a law against people wearing monks robes. But somehow they, they accepted the devotees and the devotees uh, preached there and they also showed their willingness to cooperate, to cooperate with the laws which are there. And so the, they gradually recognized the devotees. And so it, it takes time to work into these places. Just like Srila Prabhupada met that cardinal, there's a famous interview, Prabhupada talking to the cardinal in Paris. And that cardinal was preaching that there's nothing wrong in eating beef. That beef eating is, it's good for your health. And you know, like this, you're saying like that. And Prabhupada of course was talking and Prabhupada was arguing and telling him, trying to convince him that this meat eating is wrong and it's not necessary. And, and the, the cardinal, of course, he could not accept. And then later on, after some time, uh, they found this cardinal dead in the, womb, in the bed of the most famous prostitute in Paris. <laughs> it's a, a well-known incident, you know. <laughs> so, Sometimes you get these kind of contradictions, you know, you get these people who are arguing in favor of their, their sinful life. And why are they arguing for their sinful life? Because they're so addicted to sin themselves that they cannot possibly imagine living without sin. So trying to get people to give up 
meat eating and intoxication. It, it's so difficult for them. They just cannot believe it. Mahayogi was talking to me yesterday. He was telling he'd been to Europe, and he was telling me. He said, "Wow, I could see how difficult it must be to preach in Europe." He said, "The people there, they're so passionate, and there's so much in ignorance. It must be." He said, "I could see it's really difficult to preach there." to make devotees there, really not easy. Just the, 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 the whole atmosphere, the, the life is, is just so difficult. You know, the climate is difficult, and the cost of living is high, and the cost of food is so expensive, everything is so difficult. People have to struggle so hard. And so he said, I could understand. But he said at the same time, the people are thinking, Oh, I'm okay. I'm doing all right. You know, yes. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> they don't appreciate how miserable their lives are and how unfortunate they are. Eat horrible things and do all horrible activities, and they're thinking it's pleasure. They're thinking it's pleasure. Of course, Lord Rishabdev was telling his sons. He, Lord Rishabdev didn't have one son or two sons, he had a hundred sons. And he was telling them all, you know, Nayam de ho de ha bajam niraloki, that don't waste this human form of life that sense gratification is available even for the pigs which eat stool. But people are so, they're so ignorant. They're thinking life is meant for the, the same pleasure as the hogs and the dogs. The pigs which eat stool, they're thinking that's enjoyment. And people eat the, the hog, they eat the pig. The pigs eat the stool and people eat the pigs. And they don't just only eat pigs, they eat, so, they eat everything. Hmm? <laughs> we, we used, they used to say in China that in China they will eat anything which flies in the air, anything which crawls on the ground and anything which swims in the sea. And you can go in a market and you can see so many different varieties of species of life in the market. It's all available for people to cook. So this is hell. But people are not appreciating that this is hell. They're thinking this is their enjoyment. Just like they have uh, Easter turkeys in the West, you know, and the devotees, they try to educate people, you know, you can have a vegetarian turkey, you know, it doesn't have to be the real thing. You can, you can have a nice meal without eating all these animals. People are so callous, they're so blind. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he saw this woman carrying a fish on a string. She was taking it home to cook the fish. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati remarked how cold-hearted people are, that they don't even think about these other living entities. Of course, sometimes you get people the other way. They want to do some punya karma, you know, looking for some, try to change the luck. They want better luck. And the, the one girl was working in the shop and uh, her boss told her, business is slow, go to the market, get some fish, put them back in the sea. That's her punya karma. Or go to the market, buy some birds, let the birds go free. This is their idea, punya karma. And when the business is good, then they buy the birds, chop them up and eat them. And so, it's all, 
so foolishness. People are so blind, so ignorant. They don't understand the basic laws of life and nature, that there's prescribed food for living entities. But I was doing one program in China one time, and I was preaching that, you know, don't eat meat, and especially don't eat the cow. And so this one lady said, my son only eats cow meat. So I told her, you bring your son. You bring your son to, to us, we're going to speak to him. And so the next day she brought her son. And so we talked to the son. It turned out that when he was a young boy, he was in poor health. And the mother said, the mother said, yeah, she said, actually, I used to cook cow's meat for him. Because he was in poor health, I thought if I cook cow's meat, that would be good for his health. That, I thought that's the best meat. So I'll give him cow's meat. It would be good for his health. And so he said, now he will only eat cow's meat. He won't eat any other meat. And so I told her, I said, you see, this is your fault. You want your son now to stop it, but you were the one who gave him the cow's meat in the beginning. And she said, well, I didn't know. I just wanted him to be healthy. And the people, they don't know. They're just ignorant about these things. They're thinking cow's meat, good for health. They don't realize the karmic reactions which come when they kill the cow. And to kill the cow, for every hair on the body of the cow, you have to take birth and be killed. It's the most sinful thing. Because the cow is in line, is going to become human in the next life. The natural evolution of the soul is that from the cow body, the cow will become human in the next life. And if people will kill the cow, then they stop that cow from progressing to the human life. The cow has to take birth again to continue his time in that body. So it's very sinful to kill the cows. Of course, people don't understand the value in these animals. They think, well, if we don't kill them, they'll, flood, they'll cover the whole planet. <laughs> they don't realize that cows have been there for millions of years and they've never had any problem. There's never been any problem of cows overpopulating the planet. The problem with overpopulation was the Kshatriya kings. When the Kshatriya kings were over, they overburdened the planet. And Mother Bhumi had to go to Lord Vishnu, go to Lord Brahma, and Brahma went to Vishnu to get help to rectify that situation. So an overpopulation of Kshatriya kings is there. Actually, the problem was not just Kshatriya kings, but the the problem was the, the demonic nature of the Kshatriya kings. Because the people were not of good quality, that was the problem. But the world would not be overburdened by devotees. If there's an overpopul there's no question of overpopulation of devotees. The more devotees we have, the more the planet will be in a healthy condition. So it's quality which is required. It's not the quantity which is the problem. People are thinking, oh, the world will be overpopulated, so we should do abortions. We should have abortions. And they do birth control and things like so many demonic activities. And it, it's so common nowadays, you talk to women Ordinary women, they'll say, yeah, well, yeah, I've had three abortions. And someone else, oh, oh I had five abortions. You know, it, it's just so, such a common thing. It's shocking for devotees to hear this, but it's common. And in India, it's also common. In India, which is supposed to be Punya Bhumi, but it's so common there. So, we have to educate people about these things. That 
There is no problem of overpopulation. The problem is in the quality of the people. And the quality means you have to educate them. And not, all, not just material education, but spiritual education. People have to be taught about the value of human life. And they have to be taught what is actual human culture, what is civilized human life. They have to be taught the value of life. And they have to be taught how to live in harmony with the world. Nowadays more and more scientists are recognizing how there's, we're heading for disasters. As we go more and more people, different countries, you know, like China and building so many factories and developing their economy. And then India starts to build more and more factories and develop their economy. And they're thinking, this is success. They're thinking developing their economy, more factories, more motor cars and motor bikes everywhere. They're thinking this is a developed economy. They're not realizing how many abortions and how much cow killing is going on in the country. They're not recognizing what is actually a civilized na nation. So, we need to educate people. We need, we need to give this knowledge to people, to convince people how we cannot just simply go on developing more and more technology and having more and more industries and steel mills and factories and so many things. This is not going to help the world. Rather, this is going to create hell for the planet. And the real need for people is to cultivate a more natural way of life rather than this artificial lifestyle. Just like today being Sunday, everyone will go out to eat, right? It's customary in this part of the world. I know like in Singapore, 98% of the population of Singapore eat out on the weekend. And it's probably pretty high here also in Kuala Lumpur. People have that habit. They, they, don't, they don't even like to cook. Nowadays they build houses, they don't even think about putting a kitchen. People just all go out to eat. What's the need of a kitchen? Well, a kitchen, no. we'll go out. And they, they, so you get people, they don't even know how to cook. They have no idea how, a vegetarian, they don't know how to cook. So this is one of the problems people have, trying to be vegetarian. They don't know how to cook, they don't know how to do things like bathe, regular. The, all, all of these things are forgotten in the name of economic development. So we're trying to educate people about these values of life. Hygiene also very important. People have very poor hygiene in the Kali Yuga. They're very la lazy. Devamrita Swami was giving class one time, I was hearing him give a class, he was talking how he got on a train in Europe and it, it was traveling the whole night. And he, he happened to notice that on this train there's a shower and he could take a bath in the morning. And he thought, oh great, I'll be able to bathe in the morning. He, he thought, I better wake up early so I can go and take a bath before everyone else. And so he, took, he got up early, took his bath, and he said, I was sitting in the train, he said, I watched, he said, nobody else went, not one person even went to bathe. He said, the train was full. He said, I, I thought I have to get up early to take a bath. He said, nobody got up. 
and nobody took a bath. That's life in, in the West. <laughs> People just don't have that habit. They don't have the culture. And so, you know, we're trying to educate people about the values of life. We're trying to teach them about the next life. It's, it's really a big job. It's really not an easy thing to convince people about the importance of spiritual culture. But it's, it's certainly possible. And Prabhupada says, if even a small percentage of the planet become Krishna conscious, the whole world can be changed. At least people are starting to understand that there are higher principles to life. And gradually, more and more people will start to respect these things. Even they're not able to follow them, they start to respect that this is actually a good thing. They can appreciate that this is something different, something genuine. So we, we have a long way to go, we have a lot of work to do, but the foundation is there. Prabhupada put the foundation, we have to develop it. Some comments? Yes, Sanjamil Prabhu. I was <coughs> preaching with uh, one person, one lady, and uh, explaining how, regarding the hellish planets, that um, in this material world that we live in, there is such a thing as you know, heaven and hell. Some people get in and die in a great hellish condition, and some people are, are, are reasonably heavenly. And, uh, and that afterlife, uh, in the afterlife, awaits a very hellish condition for people who break the principles, you know, mediating and so on. So she said, uh, she said no, 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 God is full of love. God is full of love. He loves everybody. You can't scare people like this. Why are you trying to scare people? So, I mean, I gave her a particular answer, but what's your, how would you respond to such a lady's uh, illusion? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, God is love, but he gives, his, he, he gives his love in different ways, right? For these people who, do, who are doing so many sinful activities, of course, they are, they, usually they're, they don't think of God, they have no consciousness of God. So God comes to them as death. And God comes to take everything away from them. Come, comes as death. That's his love. That is his loving relationship with them. When death comes and takes away the, at that time, then people become more aware. Yeah, difficult. God is love. He does, God loves. God is a person, first of all, right? We want her to under... God is not simply the, the action, but he's the person who has love, who has that feeling of love. And he gives that love to his devotees, to those who love him. He reciprocates. He's a person, just like you are a person. We're all persons. We, ha we have feelings. We have emotions. Yes, we have the ability to love, but if you love your dog and if you love God, there is a difference. We have, we have to appreciate that God has feelings and he reciprocates with the feelings of every individual. So, this lady is talking about God being love. She's, she's denying the person, that he's a person. We, ha we have to, the Prabhupada preached so much about this importance of understanding God as a person. It's not impersonal. And just say God is love. Yes, he, love is his feelings, he has love. And he has also 
he can have also anger. He, he is a person and he, has, he reciprocates with that feeling which is shown by different people. As you surrender to him, then he rewards you accordingly. So somebody is engaging in all kinds of hellish activities. They're living in hell and they go to hell. Vyadi ma jiva ma mara. Jiva Goswami tells the story about the four men, right? And the butcher's son. The astrologer said about the butcher's son, Vyadi ma jiva ma mara. For the butcher, don't live, don't die. He's living in hell, and when he dies, he will go to hell. All right, so you, the meat eater, they're living in hell, they're eating all hellish things, and when they die, they'll go to hell. That's, that's love. No, the Malachya are not part. They're outside the Vedic system. They're the uncivilized. The four Varnas are all the Vedic. They're civilized. But the Malachya is outside that Vedic culture. And the Malachyas. Now you may say, well, sometimes the Kshatriyas eat meat. Yes. Sometimes they do, but they go and kill it. They go and kill the animal themselves. They go hunt. They go to the jungle and they hunt the animals. They will hunt the wild animals who are giving trouble to the sages and so on in the forest. They will hunt these animals. They will never kill the cow. They will never kill the innocent creature like the cow. You want to eat meat, then all right, there's a system. Goat, you take the goat and then on the dark moon night, dark moon night means once in a month and you go in front of the goddess Kali and you say, I'm going to kill you, in the future you can kill me. So that is the Vedic, that is Veda. You want to eat meat, they have to do it that way. Dark moon night, once in a month. There's, there's some temples like that. Is it, is it Butterworth up there? They have that Kali temple or something. They do a goat sacrifice. Yeah, and, and when they do the goat sacrifice, many people will go there. They all want to get the blood or something, you know, drink the blood and taste the meat. So, they, but they, they're telling the goat, I'm going to kill you. In the future, you can kill me. That is, so any intelligent person, they'll think about that. They'll think, why I should do that? Why I should kill now, they're in the future, they're going to kill me. Any intelligent person will understand, this is not, I have to stop this. I'm giving myself so much suffering. And Narada Muni was preaching to Maharaj Prachini Barishat in Srimad Bhagavatam. Maharaj Prasini Barisat was doing a lot of Vedic yakyas. And Narada Muni came and told him, he said, you know, you've killed all these animals. They're waiting for you. They're going to come and get you in the future. And so Maharaj Prachini Barishat, he was fortunate. He got the association of Narada Muni so he could awaken to what is what he should do but for ordinary meat eaters it's very difficult to convince them one th nice thing which happened was that uh, they had the scientific conference in Bombay and uh, many different scientists came especially from the US 
And some of them were even Nobel Prize winners. And they came for the scientific symposium. So one, this one devotee was going with the, this Nobel Prize winner, taking him back to the airport after the seminar had been held for a few days. And so he was asking him, so uh, Professor so-and-so, you know, what did you think of the semester? How did you enjoy the conference? And he said, well, you know, he said, you know, the thing which I learned, you know, the thing which uh, I most appreciate, he said, he said I, now I can appreciate that I can be satisfied on a vegetarian diet. Because he came to Bombay and they took food in the restaurant at Juhu and they had vegetarian, of course vegetarian. And so he, he was amazed that he said, you know, I said, I never realized I could be satisfied on a vegetarian diet. So th this is very important to give people very nice vegetarian food and they should realize how satisfying uh, how nourishing and how healthy it is. And Prabhupada had a, a meeting with one of these scientists one time and in the beginning Prabhupada was preaching to the scientist and the scientist was, mm, yeah, you know, he was, he was not taking it very, you know, he, he, was, he was not against but he was not greatly impressed. But what happened while Prabhupada was talking to him, they brought in a big maha plate, the maha plate, and they gave the maha plate to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada took the maha plate, it was the Raj Bog, or maybe it was the evening offering, but it was a lot of really tasty dishes, you know, uh, eggplant paramahams, uh, param, par, er, eggplant parmesan, and these kind of dishes, you know, really opulent. And they, Prabhupada took the plate and gave it to the scientist, said, this is for you. And the scientist went, oh. ah. And so <laughs> the scientist took it, you know, and he began to eat. And Prabhupada kept preaching to him. And as Prabhupada was preaching, he was eating. And he was agreeing with Prabhupada. And not only was he agreeing with Prabhupada, but the more he ate, the more he would come up with arguments to support what Prabhupada was saying. So Prabhupada was like showing us, he said, this is how you preach to these people. You know, you want to impress these people, you got to have really nice prasada. Very, very important. You want people to be convinced about vegetarianism, you got to show them how to present vegetarian food. You know, you can't just give them some soya and stuff. You know. <laughs> Than smoking. Than smoking. Mm. I mean, everyone knows that smoking you don't have to get cancer. Mm. But eating red meat, is, and this is the World Health Organization, made that declaration. Mm. So if that doesn't deter the media, then, you know, then uh, what will Well, you know, it, although people know smoking is dangerous to health, there's people are still smoking. You know, I mean, you see everywhere people smoking. It didn't stop people smoking. So the same thing with the red meat, you know. You say red meat is worse than smoking, but still people are eating. You know, they just don't care, you know. People are just so ignorant. They're, they're not even conscious. We want them to become Krishna conscious. First they have to become conscious, and then you can become Krishna conscious. But a lot of people are not even conscious. And that's why they do that. They smoke, they drink, they drink fire, you know, <laughs> fire, the, the whiskey and all these things they drink. It, it is so terrible. Yeah, it burns their organs to pieces. But people do it. They're so ignorant. They're not even conscious. So first we have to bring them to consciousness. 
and then try to change them. Very big task, right? <laughs> How is it possible? Only by the mercy of Guru and Garanga. By compassion, we have to endeavor. But there's still a lot of people out there who can be who can be changed. They can be saved. Okay. Hare Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai.